Brian received his BS in biology from uh, Boston College, uh, then went on to get a master's degree in aquatic ecology study studying diatoms at the University of Michigan. Uh, he then moved from the, to the, the med school of the University of Michigan to get his PhD uh, in medical microbiology studying with uh, Michelle Swanson, uh, studying Legionella, a nemophila, another waterborne uh, pathogen. He then took a, a postdoc with Bonnie Basler at uh, Princeton University to study uh, quorum sensing in Vibrio cholera, um, where he uh, defined uh, targets uh, that he'll possibly tell you about today uh, and did some very nice work there. Um, today he's going to talk to you about uh, research in his lab about uh, small RNA regulation of quorum sensing in the bacterial pathogen Vibrio cholera. So, so welcome, Brian. Thanks, Patrick. Is this working okay? You can hear me? Fantastic. Well, thank you for inviting me to breakfast, or maybe I should say, I guess I invited you. I don't know how that works, but um, enjoy the food. It looks delicious. Um, I'm going to tell you today about the work um, we do in my lab across the street in Cherry Emerson. So I've been at Georgia Tech for three years and have a nice cadre of graduate students and Patrick, my postdoc, and some undergrads. And we study this fascinating bacterial behavior called quorum sensing which is cell-to-cell -cell communication in bacteria. And it allows unicellular organisms to act as groups. And they do that by producing and secreting small chemical molecules that accumulate in proportion to population density. And then the bacteria respond to these and orchestrate complex behaviors as a group. And we are both interested in the molecular mechanisms of how they do that, how they convert extracellular chemical signals into gene expression, and then what those genes encode for and what behaviors they provide for the bacterium. And in particular, I study that process in a bacterial pathogen called Vibrio cholera, which you might have heard about in the news lately, was the causative agent of that outbreak of cholera in Haiti after the earthquake. This is a fascinating bacterium because not only is it capable of causing human disease, diarrheal disease, but it also is an indigenous inhabitant of marine systems. So it has this amazing dual life cycle where it can live out in marine systems and thrive just happily. When it gets into us, it can cause disease. And it gets into us because people who are unfortunate enough to consume contaminated food or water um, allow the bacteria to gain access to the small intestine. It can stick to the small intestine attach there, produce the cholera toxin, which is delivered directly into intestinal cells, resulting in hypersecretion of ion and water into the lumen of the intestine, resulting in the diarrheal disease. So it's a dreadful disease. It's still common in developing countries, again, where their infrastructure is relatively poor. We don't hear about it much in the United States, but it's still a major um, worldwide concern. And so we're interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms of how it senses and responds to its environment which of course all living things have to be able to do pretty well. The story I'm going to tell you about starts um, in the ocean and it's going to end in the ocean. So what I'm showing you here is the bobtailed squid. So this is a fascinating um, organism and what I hope you can see here are these blue orbs on either side of the squid on the bottom. These are light organs and they're colonized by a bioluminescent vibrio called Vibrio fisheri. And this is a wonderful symbiotic relationship in which the bacteria and the squid both benefit. So this squid lives in Hawaii in shallow waters and burrows into the sand during the day. And at night it comes out to feed. And in the moonlight it casts a silhouette on the sea floor. And this allows predators to track it and detect it. So this symbiotic relationship has evolved so that these bacteria that are in these light organs allow the squid to counter illuminate so it no longer casts a silhouette on the seafloor. These bacteria glow in the dark. And then at, at, um, in the morning, when the squid is about to burrow back into the sand, it expels 99% of that bacterial culture. And the bacteria that remain in that light organ stop glowing. And only as they double and double in that light organ, which to us is like a flask, they're doubling and doubling throughout the day, only when they reach high densities at night does the entire culture synchronously bioluminesce. And so this is a fascinating example of bioluminescence in the ocean. There's lots of examples of that now. In the 70s, um, this was discovered by Woody Hastings at Harvard. The interesting feature is how in the world do these bacteria do that? 
how are they regulating bioluminescence in response to population density? And that turned out to be the first example of quorum sensing that I'm going to tell you about. Turns out now we think all bacteria quorum sense. And we're learning what the chemical signals or language is and what they do with it. But this was the first example. And the way that these bioluminescent vibrios quorum sense is that at low cell densities, they have a signal producing protein or an enzyme to synthesize a small chemical signal, which I'm showing you here is just a green pentagon. And at low population densities, when there's not a lot of bacteria, there's not a lot of that chemical signal. So it is not at high enough concentrations to bind to its receptor. And in the absence of ligand binding, this receptor is unable to regulate downstream genes, which in this case are the luciferase genes, as well as, it turns out, many others. At high cell densities in that light organ, bacterial concentrations could reach 10 to the 11th per mil. You get a sufficient accumulation of that autoinducer signal now in proportion to that cell density that these signals bind to their receptors. And this ligand receptor complex is a transcription factor. And it can bind to these group response genes and turn on luciferase expression. So the entire culture bioluminesces at the same time. So it turns out that this was the first described quorum sensing system. Um, the other systems described that I'm going to show you about today have different bells and whistles. They have different chemical languages that they use, but the same end result is that in response to these chemical signals, there's changes in gene expression. So the Vibrio that I work on, Vibrio cholera, is actually bilingual, we say. So it actually produces two small chemical signals. These were identified in the Bastler lab in the last 10 years. CAI1, or cholera autoinducer 1, is this molecule here. It's 3S-hydroxy-4-tridecanone. This molecule is only produced by Vibrios, and only Vibrios have receptors to respond to it. So this bacterial signal allows for private conversations just among your cousins, right? Vibrio cholera produces this, Vibrio harvii, Vibrio fisheri. So it's private conversations among similar organisms. They also produce, though, a second chemical signal called autoinducer 2, which is a furanosyl borate diester I'm showing you on the right. O over half of all bacterial species that have been sequenced to date have the enzyme to synthesize this and produce this chemical signal. And it has been shown to facilitate interspecies communication. So E. coli can produce autoinducer 2, and Vibrio harvii can respond to it and bioluminesce as a consequence, and vice versa. Autoinducer 2 produced by Vibrios can be sensed and respond by E. coli. So bacteria both have a private conversation or a private language and a more general language. And the model for why in the world you would ever build a system like this is that the bacteria are counting themselves and others and discriminating between who they're surrounded by. And you could all imagine that we would do very different behaviors when we're only surrounded by our family members than we might do in public. And presumably, the bacteria are able to coordinate gene expression in response to whom they're surrounded by. And they're distinguish be distinguishing between self and others to turn certain genes on when they're alone and other genes on when they're in a group. So we're interested in how that works and what those responses are. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to condense down these chemical signals into these simple little shapes for you. So this is the quorum sensing regulatory pathway. It's like quarter to nine in the morning. Don't get all panicky about the pathway. I'm going to take you through it slowly. The end result, again, is the same. is that there's going to be chemical signals on the outside resulting in changes in gene expression at the bottom. But you can see that this pathway in the organism I study is a little more complex than the simple one I showed you initially. So at low cell densities, when those autoinducers are produced and they're at low concentrations because there's not a lot of cells, their receptors are unbound. So in this case, the CQS sensor is the cognate sensor for CAA1. And this Lux PQ sensor in the inner membrane is the sensor for AI2. In the absence of ligand, these are two component histidine kinase proteins, which means that in the absence of their ligand, they behave as kinases shuttling phosphate through a phosphorylation cascade. So they donate phosphate to LUX-U, which is a phosphotransferase. And then LUX-U donates that phosphate to LUX-O, which is a response regulator protein. 
Lux O needs to be phosphorylated to be an activator protein. And so at low cell densities, when it's phosphorylated, it can bind to the promoter of these small regulatory RNAs that are the focus of my talk. We call them the quorum regulatory RNAs, and there's four of them. So at low cell densities, these four small RNAs are transcribed, and they participate with this RNA binding protein called HFQ and repress a downstream target, HAPR. And HAPR is a transcription factor. It's the, it's the global regulator of the quorum sensing response. So it's at low cell densities, when those small RNAs are made, the consequence is that HAPR is not expressed. And you end up getting expression of VPS or biofilm genes that promote attachment. <laughs> you get expression of the cholera toxin that causes the disease I told you about. And the TCP, which is the uh, pili, toxin co-regulated pili that um, allow them to attach to the intestine. And in HAPR's absence, you do not express some other factors. So then at high cell densities, everything switches. So now you have a lot of bacteria. You have a lot of that chemical signal. Those signals bind to their cognate receptors. And now these receptors switch from being kinases to being phosphatases. So there's a conformational change upon ligand binding. And now phosphate flows up the pathway. Luxo is no longer phosphorylated. That's why I show it to you in gray. It's inactive. And so those small RNAs are not expressed. And in their absence, HAPR is produced. So now you have the transcription factor, right? Just like before. At high cell densities, you have the transcription factor made. And in this case, HAPR shuts off biofilm and virulence production. And you get expression of this HAPA protease, which is thought to be a detachment factor. So the model for the function of the quorum sensing pathway in vivo is that the bacteria enter the small intestine at low densities. They start attaching and producing virulence factors. And when they reach high density, autoinducer accumulation triggers release back into the environment by shutting off production of the cholera toxin and factors that promote attachment, and instead producing a protease that promotes release from the intestinal surface. So quorum sensing in this case allows the bacteria to transmit back into the environment to find a new host. That's the model. Um, I should remind you, though, that I told you cholera can exist out in marine systems totally independent of humans. So one of the interesting um, parts of this quorum sensing pathway that we're studying now is not only the role of quorum sensing in vivo, which is, of course, important and me medically relevant, but also the role of this pathway in marine systems where they don't have any encounter with the human gut. And I'll get to those um, studies at the end. And that's um, the role of this in DNA uptake. All right, so we're going to focus then on the beginning of the talk about the molecular mechanisms of how it is these non-coding regulatory RNAs can repress expression of HAPR. So what I first want to tell you is that these small RNAs are functionally redundant. So I told you there are four non-coding small RNAs. These are encoded around the bacterial chromosome and intergenic regions. It turns out that you need to delete all four of the small RNAs to see any sort of phenotype. If you have a single small RNA present on the chromosome, you get a standard quorum sensing response. And that's depicted in this particular figure. So this is showing, uh, this is a plasmid carrying Vibrio harvii, one of those bioluminescent organisms, carrying its luciferase gene. So you can monitor the amount of light produced over time per cell. So we're measuring the amount of luciferase per OD is a measure of light per cell, and we're measuring it with increasing optical density. And so this, this curve here for the wild type strain, we call this a Lux curve, because what happens is we come in in the morning to the lab, we've grown a culture overnight, just like in a squid, and it's at high density, so it's bioluminescing. Then we dilute it one to a thousand, just like when the squid expels the culture, and now the culture just has a gradual decay in the residual luciferase genes present in the cytoplasm as it's dividing and dividing. So we see a de decrease in bioluminescence by many logs. And then when you reach a critical threshold concentration, when the culture is at sufficient densities, you get a dramatic induction in bioluminescence in response to those autoinducers. 
So this is simply, a, we call this a Lux curve for wild type. If you delete that Lux O gene I told you about that controls the small RNAs, what was observed is that you're constitutive for bioluminescence. You're stuck at high cell densities because that response regulator HAPR is always made. It's never being repressed. So you get this constitutive phenotype. You get that same phenotype, it turns out, if you delete this RNA chaperone called HFQ. But what you should notice here with the black symbols is that if you delete any three of the small RNAs and simply leave one of them on the chromosome, you still generate a density-dependent phenotype, suggesting again that they're functionally redundant. You only need one. And only when you delete all four do you recapitulate this constitutive phenotype. So it turns out that that feedback loop I'm showing you here is responsible for this um, behavior and that when you have a single small RNA present, you have feedback in that you get a little extra HAPR expression which allows you to upregulate the remaining small RNA. So there's this functional redundancy is due to this feedback loop. But the main reason I told you that is because this allows us then to study the small RNAs without having to necessarily worry about four of them simultaneously on the chromosome, but we can study a single small RNA and look at its ability to regulate its target, which in this case is that HAPR um, transcription factor. So how are these small RNAs then thought to work on their downstream target? These are non-coding RNAs and they're regulatory. And the mechanism is based on models developed in E. coli by Susan Gottesman at the NIH and others. And the model is the following, that these small RNAs, which are approximately 100 base pairs in length, fold into some predicted structure, but they have a particular region that allows them to base pair and form an RNA-RNA duplex with an mRNA that has sufficient DNA sequence identity for pairing to occur. And that pairing occurs right over the ribosome binding site so that when the small RNAs are made, in our case, at low cell density, they base pair with HAPR's message and prevent ribosomal access so that no HAPR protein is made. Then at high cell densities, when the small RNAs are absent, HAPR's message is free to be translated and you get HAPR protein. So we were interested in testing this hypothesis. So we used first some computational methods to look at the predicted structure of these small RNAs. So this is simply an m-fold algorithm to look at the lowest free energy structure or predicted structure of the small RNAs. This does not necessarily reflect the native structure. And I'm showing you just one of the small RNAs. This is actually QRR number two. But each of the small RNAs folds into a very similar structure. And I'm highlighting in green what we think is the business end of this, mo of this molecule. So Helix 1, Helix 3, and Helix 4 are relatively stable stem loops and they're thought to be structural and perhaps aid in association with HFQ, which is that RNA binding protein I told you about. Whereas Helix 3 is 100% conserved among all sequenced vibrios that have been studied so far. So we have about 25 examples of sequenced vibrios, many cholera strains, Vibrio harvii, Vibrio fischeri, all of them have a similar quorum sensing system and all of them have multiple small RNAs. And so we have about 120 examples of these small RNAs. And in all cases, this 21 nucleotide sequence is invariant, 100% conserved. And what I'm going to show you is that that same 21 nucleotide sequence was predicted to associate with each mRNA target. So we were interested in then studying the contribution of these nucleotides to binding to its message. We focused initially on these first six nucleotides because as you can see they're predicted to be unpaired and therefore likely to participate at minimum in the initial interaction with a message without having the need to restructure this small RNA. We're interested in looking at this structure as well, but of course if we start changing the nucleotides in this structure we not only change nucleotide sequence but we changed predicted structure as well. So we focused on these first six nucleotides. Not only were we able to use these computer algorithms to look at the predicted structure of the RNA itself, but you can use algorithms like target RNA and RNA up to look at the predicted interactions. So these algorithms will take a sequence genome and predict what targets the small RNA might interact with. 
or you can feed them your own mRNA and ask them to look for the predicted interaction interface. And so again, I'm showing you that same 21 nucleotide sequence on the top in the 5 prime to 3 prime orientation, and then the predicted interaction with the message on the bottom. You could see that that prediction again included overlap with the ribosome binding site. And you could see one of the important features of these small RNAs in bacteria, and these are a lot like microRNAs in eukaryotic systems. Um, they have these mismatches. So one can't simply scan a genome and look for a complementary sequence to this 21 nucleotide region. And what I'm going to tell you, I don't show you in this particular presentation, but we have now five or six targets of the small RNAs. The same 21 nucleotide sequence is involved in pairing, and yet in each case the mismatches are different. So this is the real challenge for us, and it's not unique to the bacterial world, is trying to find the targets of the small RNAs, particularly when the rules you learn for one particular interaction don't necessarily apply to the other interactions. So again, we're, what we did here is we took a computer algorithm called RNA up, and we used that algorithm to predict the consequence of changing these particular nucleotides and predict the consequence to pairing of its target and then we use those predictions to do our experiments. So what I'm going to show you then is an E. coli experiment. So remember I told you we can get away with using a single small RNA and looking at its control on a particular message and so we do that by treating E. coli as if it were a test tube which of course it's not and what we do is we have two different plasmids. We have a, one plasmid where we can express the small RNA and then into E. coli, we introduce another plasmid which harbors a HAPR GFP translational fusion. So it has the predicted pairing region. And instead of monitoring then HAPR itself, we're monitoring green fluorescent protein expression as a readout for small RNA function. And so what I'm showing you then over here is HAPR GFP expression. And I'm showing you on the bottom the different um, small RNAs or HAPRs that we included on the plasmids, as well as the in silico predictions. So when HAPR is expressed in E. coli alone, we get the maximum level of GFP expression. When we introduce in now the plasmid carrying the small RNA, we get a predicted free energy of that interaction using this algorithm. And we see that we get repression as expected. Right? Our interpretation is, is that the small RNA is pairing with HAPR's message in preventing translation. That's what we're testing. If we look at the predicted interaction, it's, you don't really need a computer algorithm to look and see that if you change that single A, you should have no consequence to pairing. Right? So we actually did that. The prediction, of course, is that there's no change in the binding. And we see that that small RNA is still able to fully repress. And that computer algorithm then predicted that of these six particular nucleotides, the most important nucleotide was at this position here. And so what we did is we changed the C to a G. We call that the C30G mutation. The prediction was is that it would have a major effect on free energy of binding. And what we see is that we lose all of our repression as predicted. So again, you should be able to then also make the mutation on HAPR alone and see the same effect. And the prediction is, is that again it would um, disrupt the binding and we see no repression. And then the real proof of the punch is that you should be able to restore the interaction by combining the two mutations, right? And the prediction was in fact that we would restore pairing and sure enough we do. So now when we have the mutation both on the small RNA side and both on the HAPR side, we restore repression. Consistent with not only is there an interaction there, but the interaction is exactly where we think it is, between those two nucleotides. So this was an E. coli experiment. Of course, um, what we wanted to do next then is in vitro test actual binding of the small RNA to its message. And so this is the work that Patrick did in the lab, Patrick who introduced me. So he in vitro synthesized the small RNAs, HAPAR's message, and purified Vibrio cholera's HFQ RNA chaperone or RNA binding protein. And that HFQ protein, as I told you, is predicted to bind to RNAs and facilitate the interaction of the two RNAs with one another. And that's why deletion of HFQ from the chromosome resulted in the same phenotype as not having small RNAs at all. So he tested that in vitro.
by measuring binding of a radio labeled small RNA to the HAPR message. And so this is a gel shift experiment where the small RNA is radio labeled. Again, he's using just a single small RNA, the same one as in vivo. And you can see that when we add increasing amounts of unlabeled HAPR message, and in this case, he's using about four nanomolar of the small RNA. And you can see when we add enough of the message, up to 640 nanomolar, so a vast molar excess, we end up getting a shift in indicative of a complex or an interaction between the two. However, if he includes HFQ in that reaction, the shift occurs at much lower concentrations of HAPAR's message. And so we can actually plot those and calculate the KD, or effective um, binding constant, and we can see that we get an increase of about 50-fold in the KD. And these numbers are consistent, again, with the E. coli literature on the contribution of HFQ to a small RNA-mRNA interaction. So this was pleasing that HFQ indeed was aiding in allowing the small RNA and its target to associate. And then he used that system then to test those mutants, those mutations we had made and shown in vivo played a role. And he was testing whether the in vivo phenotypes we saw were due to actual binding defects between the small RNA and its target. And so now he's only looking at a single concentration of HAPR. So this is, should be digital. We're just looking for a shift or no shift. And in this case, when we have just the wild type small RNA alone, you see that it migrates this far. When wild type HAPR is provided, we see the shift. However, if that HAPR has that single base pair mutation that had an in vivo consequence, we see no shift. The mutated small RNA still migrates at the same position. It cannot bind to wild type HAPR message, but the combination of the two together results in a shift. So absolutely consistent with the in vivo results in E. coli. So up to this point then, I've shown you the interaction of the small RNA and its target in E. coli, but of course, in E. coli, when they're both under control of plasmids, we've totally removed all the biology we claim we're interested in studying, which is quorum sensing, right? I'm a biologist. I want to study quorum sensing. So what we did is we took all of the information we had gained in vitro and in E. coli and moved it onto the cholera chromosome. And we did it in this order because doing E. coli experiments is pretty simple, right? We have two plasmids, we make some mutations. To move them onto the cholera chromosome was not trivial because first, we had to delete all four endogenous small RNAs from the chromosome. Then, we had to lock Vibrio cholera in a condition where the small RNAs are always expressed. So we use an allele of Luxo on the chromosome where the aspartate has been mutated to a glutamate or glutamate to aspartate, and this effectively locks Luxo in an active phosphorylated conformation. So a Luxo D47E mutant is constitutively producing the small RNAs. So we delete all the small RNAs, we make a Luxo D47E, then we introduce back onto the chromosome either our small RNA we want to study and the allele of the HAPR message we want to study. And put them all on the chromosome under their endogenous control in single copy. And that's what I'm going to show you here. So first what we wanted to do is simply look at HAPR protein levels in cholera. And so these are western blots with uh, HAPR antibody using the same mutations we told you about already. This is the HAPR band here and this is a, a control lane. And so what you see here is that in the absence of HAPR we see no HAPR protein. We can see the wild type or the mutated HAPR protein. However, when the small RNAs now are expressed in cholera, we see a near elimination of HAPR protein as expected. However, if we make the mutation, single nucleotide mutation in the small RNA or the message, we abolish repression and the combination of the two restores repression. So indeed, the small RNAs can fully prevent translation of HAPR's message by base pairing. And then we were interested in looking at the consequence, the phenotypic consequence of now disrupting the quorum sensing response. So we monitored expression of VPS, AFA, HAP, and COMI A transcription, and also the phenotypes controlled by each of those genes. And I'm going to show you those data now. And you should just focus on the pattern of expression. So for this VPS gene, which is the Vibrio polysaccharide gene, what you'd expect to see, since it is repressed by HAPR, 
is a pattern that looks like this, a little smiley face. So you should see maximal expression when there's an interaction and HAPR is prevented from being translated. You should see that it decreases when the interaction doesn't occur and you restore it with the two mutations. So we see this pattern of expression for Vibrio polysaccharide transcription. We see the exact same pattern for biofilm formation. So the two columns here that represent maximal polysaccharide expression, we see the production of this floating biofilm. It's called a pellicle for cholera at the broth air interface and you see it in the third and fifth test tube. We also looked at the production of virulence factors which are again repressed by HAPR and so since they are also repressed you should see a similar pattern, the smiley face, and we see that again for AFA, which is a transcriptional activator of the virulence genes. And we actually monitored cholera toxin secretion into the medium and we can see the same pattern that you only get cholera toxin production in the third and fifth bar just as we expected. And then if we look at the next two targets, now notice that these are HAPR activated targets. So you should expect that the pattern of regulation will be opposite, so we should see frowns, right? And so that, that's exactly what we see. For HAP-A transcription, we see maximal expression when the interaction does not occur. And we can actually monitor secreted protease activity as a measure of HAP-A transcription as well. And then the final phenotype we measured was this competence gene or DNA uptake that's going to be the rest of the talk. That's why it led you in this direction. You should see again that this is a frown or repressed when the interaction occurs and we can see that at the level of transcription and then we can actually monitor DNA uptake or transformation frequency. So we're monitoring the ability of cholera in response to quorum sensing molecules to take up extracellular DNA from its environment. And that's what the remainder of the talk is going to be on. So what I've shown you then is that in response to autoinducers, these small RNAs are um, regulated in response to cell density and that their ability to bind to HAPR affects the quorum sensing response. And it turns out that there are hundreds of genes controlled by HAPR. The reason I'm showing you these are these are the ones that most people study, which are the interesting genes involved in disease and attachment. Um, and I'm going to talk to you for the rest of the time now about this competence gene, or COMEA, which is involved in DNA uptake. So I told you a, a little lie so far, which is just that this quorum sensing pathway indeed regulates this competence genes, but in addition to quorum sensing, there's another extracellular signal that's required. And that signal is chitin. So all the vibrios live out in marine environments, and chitin which is what is um, used to compose crab shells and zooplankton molts, is a great source of carbon for those organisms in marine environments that can figure out how to eat it. So if you can have a breakfast of chitin, you're doing pretty good, right? Because you can eat shells. So it turns out all Vibrios have multiple chitinase enzymes to break down chitin into its constituent and acetylglucosamine. And so it turns out that to monitor competence or DNA uptake, we actually have to grow cholera on crab shells in the presence of chitin. And so what I'm showing you here is that not only does cholera respond to autoinducer molecules by this elaborate phosphorylation cascade, but in response to chitin, you get activation of another regulator called TFOX. It's a regulator of transformation, that's why it's named as such. And in the presence of chitin, it was shown that cholera upregulates genes for utilizing chitin, those chitinases. But in addition, what was observed, and this was by microarrays in 2005 by the Schoolnick lab, is that you also saw upregulation of some competence genes involved in DNA uptake. And this was really fascinating. I love this paper because it was known since 2001 when they sequenced the cholera genome that it looked like it had all of the machinery required for taking up DNA, right? Transformation is this classic studies by Griffith in 1928 that showed that you can transform bacteria into a pathogen if you give it cell extracts from a strain that has genes for virulence factors. This was classic experiments that identified DNA as the molecule of inheritance in the 1920s. Turns out cholera was thought in 2001 that it should be able to do this too, but no one could get that to work in the lab. And what Schoolnick um, connected was that 
perhaps the missing signal that we weren't including in our laboratory microcosms was the presence of chitin, that cholera has evolved to live out in the ocean and eat chitin. So in fact, if you grow them in the presence of chitin, you actually can document DNA uptake, and he showed that. And importantly, what he showed is that you need a functional quorum sensing system to do that as well. So we began studying this pathway as well because our interest is this side of the pathway initially. And um, the Schoolnick lab had worked on the chitin side. And so what we actually do is we do um, assays with crab shells. So this is our chitin inducible system. So it's a 12 well plate. So my son and I go to the DeKalb farmer's market and gorge ourselves on blue crab. And then I simply bring in the shells for my graduate student to use in her experiments. She breaks them up into little pieces, little pellets. Um, they're autoclaved, they're sterilized. We add artificial seawater that's been autoclaved and we grow a biofilm on the surface of that crab shell. And what we do to monitor whether they can take up DNA is to artificially introduce into the cholera chromosome a canamycin resistance marker. Now, of course, naturally, the reason we think bacteria might take up extracellular DNA is to acquire new traits. That if they can acquire a piece of DNA horizontally that encodes for genes that give them new function, that provides them some fitness advantage in particular environments. So to monitor DNA uptake, we simply add in a nice reporter, canamycin resistance gene, and that allows us to then plate the bacteria in the presence of canamycin and count the number of transformants that have successfully taken up the DNA we provided. So this is just genomic prep. We just use a standard genomic um, DNA isolation kit. And this chromosomal DNA is 100% identical to the wild type cholera DNA, except that it carries a canamycin resistance gene that we introduced at a particular locus. We introduced it, in fact, at the LAC-Z locus. So when they take up DNA, they not only become canamycin resistant, they become LAC minus, and we can actually record that on the plates as well. So we use that then to monitor DNA uptake. And so what I'm showing you here is we're monitoring competence or COMEA gene expression on the top, and we're measuring that in a variety of mutants to document that these autoinducers are important for regulating DNA uptake. So in the white bars here are conditions under which we don't in induce this TFOX. So when we measure competence gene expression, we do a little trick. Instead of growing them on the chitin, we have an inducible TFOX gene. So we don't have to grow these on the crab shell. We can simply add IPTG to induce TFOX in the absence of chitin. And so when we don't turn on TFOX expression, you see no Kamiya expression. You can see that for the wild type strain, we get maximum competence. However, if we delete the gene for synthesizing autoinducer 2, we see a decrease. We see a further decrease when we delete CQSA, the autoinducer 1 synthase and we see a lower level when neither autoinducer is produced. These are the locked mutants I told you about. So Luxo mutants always quorum sense. They always take up DNA. And HAPR mutants can't turn on COMEA, and so we get minimal expression. And a TFOX mutant behaves just like wild type because we've deleted the TFOX gene from the chromosome, but we've added back that TFOX inducible system. Then we actually measure transformation frequency on the crab shells, like I told you about. And so now the signal is actually chitin, as well as these two extracellular autoinducers. And we can see a similar pattern where we get a decrease in transformation efficiency as we remove the autoinducers. We get the best expression in the strain that always quorum senses, and the strains that can't make either HAPR or TFOX, we get no transformants. And again, we're counting just the number of can-resistant colonies, and we're measuring that um, as a percentage of the total number of colonies present. So we also measured the effect of purified autoinducers, because those reviewers asked us to do this in our manuscript, and we said we would love to do that. So we took purified autoinducers, and now we add them back from the outside to document that they are sufficient to see the response. And so now I'm depicting over here that we've deleted both autoinducer synthases, so cholera can't make its own autoinducers, and instead we're providing them exogenously from the top. And you can see that we, we get the same 
Graded response and competence gene expression, the maximal expression when both are provided exogenously, and a decrease with one, the other, or neither. And that again is in the presence of TFOX induction, but we can also then sprinkle in those autoinducers into our chitin assay in the crab shells, and we see a similar pattern of expression where we get maximum transformation efficiency when both are provided, and we see a decrease, and we see the minimal amount, or a hundredfold less, when neither autoinducer is provided. So we thought this was kind of cool, but we thought the most interesting feature of the quorum sensing system I described for you is that the Vibrio autoinducers, remember I told you they're bilingual, those autoinducer molecules are produced by members of the genus, not just by the species. So all Vibrios produce CAI1 autoinducer, and all Vibrios produce AI2, or most of them do, and have quorum sensing systems. So we were wondering whether autoinducers produced in a complex biofilm might be able to induce DNA uptake for cholera. Because right now we're growing these monospecies biofilms on our crab shell. So to me, this is, how many ecologists are, this to me is ecology, but for the ecologist, this is not hardcore ecology. I mean, I'm growing these things in a shell, in a 12-well plate monoculture. So we kick that up just a tiny bit, and what we do is multi-species biofilms, where we grow a Vibrio cholera strain that can't make its own autoinducers, and grow it in combination on the biofilm with another Vibrio species that can produce the chemical signals for it. And we think that this more likely um, mimics natural biofilms that are going to be mixed species in composition rather than monospecies. And so what I'm showing you here then is that cholera responds to interspecies autoinducers and promotes DNA uptake in response. So now the autoinducers, again, are not being provided by cholera itself. They're not being added in, sprinkled in from the top as purified autoinducer molecules, but they're be being provided by another Vibrio grown in that same microcosm environment. And we're measuring transformation frequency. This is our control over here. So again, this is an autoinducer deficient strain when grown in co-culture with a cholera strain will take up DNA maximally if that cholera donor produces both autoinducers. And then we see the same decrease as before when that strain produces one, the other, or neither. We can also co-culture it in the presence of its cousin, Vibrio harvii. And Vibrio harvii in this assay then is communicating with cholera and inducing DNA uptake by its pathogenic cousin. So in this case, Vibrio harvii, we have again four different strains that we had in the lab. A strain of Harvey that makes both autoinducers, one, the other, or neither, and you see the same pattern. And then we got some other Vibrio strains from some colleagues, and we are showing you just a few examples here. This is Vibrio parahemolyticus that actually makes both autoinducers, like I told you, and we get a pretty good transformation frequency. However, Vibrio fisheri, it turns out, is one of these rare Vibrios that makes autoinducer two only and not autoinducer one, and we see a decrease. So we think that this demonstrates that cholera can not only sense and respond to its own chemical signals to take up DNA, but signals produced by other members of the consortium. And what we're interested in doing now, which we haven't um, yet demonstrated, is that these experiments, again, I told you, we have extracellular DNA that is cholera-specific DNA. It's cholera's DNA. And what we'd love to document is that in response to autoinducer chemical signals produced by your cousins, is cholera able, able of taking up DNA from its cousins, right? Interspecies DNA uptake in response to interspecies autoinducer signaling. And that's what we're working on as one of the things, uh, future directions. So then this is the Vibrio cholera quorum sensing system. We think this complexity is, is beautiful and we're interested in studying the components that allow this coordinated response to these extracellular chemical signals. I spent most of the talk telling you just about this little repressive arrow that these small RNAs actually repress up R. But it turns out that these small RNAs have lots of targets. So I identified um, a couple years ago that these small RNAs can not only repress certain genes but activate others. They again do that by base pairing. But they do that by, it's called um, anti-antisense activation, which is they base pair with the message in a region that opens up the ribosome binding site rather than including it. Turns out that the small RNAs actually repress their own activator. So um, ELSA in the lab is studying the rules for each of these interactions. 
Turns out that the small RNAs, we found some additional targets, both activated and repressed, and Patrick is working on one of those. Turns out that these interactions between this chitin uptake system and the quorum sensing system, I've depicted them as these undashed or straight arrows, implying that those are direct interactions, but that is not necessarily the case. So just as this pathway has multiple steps, A, B, C, D, E, F, each of these arrows can have multiple steps as well. And as molecular geneticists, we love finding new arrows and pathways. That's what we like to do, right, is make connections. So Elena is actually working on a project and has identified that this step is in fact at least three steps here. She's identified new members of that pathway, so we're pretty excited about that. So hopefully what I've been able to communicate with you is that bacteria talk to one another using small chemical signals that we call autoinducers. That quorum sensing plays a role in cholera's association with the human host, but also a role in the environment. That HFQ dependent small RNA, mRNA base pairing interactions coordinate the response. That in the presence of chitin, cholera can take up extracellular DNA in response to autoinducers that we provide it from a variety of locations, either purified, self-produced, or produced by others. And that autoinducers derived from other members in this complex multi-species biofilm can promote that DNA uptake. As I told you, we have a bunch of current directions that we're all excited to work on, which is that um, identifying additional targets. So Patrick has indeed identified an additional target that he's working on now. Define those base pairing requirements. This is the work of graduate student Elsa in the lab. Identifying those connections between the quorum sensing pathway and the chitin utilization pathway. And so Elena has performed some uh, high throughput genetic screens to find additional members of that regulatory cascade. Characterize quorum sensing in, and natural competence among environmental isolates. So all this work I just showed you is all based on one clinical isolate of cholera that every lab works on. I mean, we all have the same experience, which is we work on one strain or one organism or one cell line and say, this is how it works for everybody, right? And of course, that's not the case. We have a sequence genome of Jim Watson. That doesn't mean we know how every human behaves, right? So we are going now into the environment and we've harvested environmental isolates of cholera and we're characterizing them for the regulatory pathways we've defined for this one isolate. And of course, the rules are all different and we're interested in how they're different, how they can actually accomplish these tasks, even though it looks like they're defective in some parts of the pathway. And that's the work of a master student and an undergraduate. We'd love to document interspecies DNA uptake, and so Elena is working on that and developing some assays to do that. And monitor DNA uptake in a complex biofilm. So this is some future work that um, two undergraduates are working on now. Instead of relying solely on canamycin resistance, as a monitor or a method for measuring transformation, we're interested in using visualization techniques, for example, GFP fluorescence, to monitor live DNA uptake by either confocal microscopy or use um, flow cytometry to actually document in real time the ability of bacteria to take up DNA and not rely on waiting for 24 hours to plate for antibiotic resistance. So this is the members of the lab. Then I told you about Patrick and Elsa, so their work was just published uh, about a month ago on the small RNA work. And then Elena's work just got accepted last week on the chitin-induced DNA uptake. Um, the other members of the lab, I talked about briefly what they're working on. Um, we have this summer also an undergraduate and a teacher in the lab developing um, teaching activities centered around bioluminescence and bacteria and, and cells to be used in Mr. Tobby's uh, fifth grade classroom. And I want to thank, of course, um, Roger and Taylor, who are in this building, who helped us with all the HFQ and small RNA work, and of course, for um, funding to do the work. Thank you very much. <laughs> are there questions? Yes. So, in, in some of the initial results that you were showing, um, when you were playing around with like changing bases and seeing if you could recapitulate what you saw initially. Um, would you say that the absolute values there are important or just the fact that you were able to show that a reduction or, or not an Yeah. When you change the last you know phase, you actually found like a even a bigger decrease. That's a great question. We we weren't sure about that, but we by multiple assays see that that looks like it's better at repressing. 
And so we are interested in studying that. I mean, there is certainly some play in the, when you measure bioluminescence, um, changes threefold are not terribly um, significant. But in that particular case, for multiple phenotypes, not only transcriptional changes, we see that it looks like it's more repressive. So we're interested, in, yes, in understanding whether um, in that particular case you get stronger binding. We haven't measured binding in that case, whether that is real. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes? If I understood correctly, the form sends the molecules to decrease the expression of the collagen. Yeah. Has anybody looked at those potential therapeutics to treat collagen? So that's a fantastic question. So one of the reasons that quorum sensing has gotten a lot of people excited is because in lots of bacterial pathogens, they regulate virulence gene expression in response to their autoinducers. Now a lot of those pathogens, Pseudomonas being the best example, uses quorum sensing to upregulate virulence gene expression. And this is why the mantra was that quorum sensing is gang behavior. When they get in a group, they launch their attack and that they don't want to do that when they're in your bodies at low numbers. Cholera is the oddball that it actually uses quorum sensing to facilitate release. Now our model is that that's because cholera is a self-limiting pathogen and so it never stays in your body forever. It clears, whereas Pseudomonas in the CF lung sticks and it, when it quorum senses, it produces more virulence factors and more biofilm to attach better. So in both cases, or in many cases, there are medicinal chemists and their natural products experts looking for inhibitors or augmenters of the pathway. In the case of Pseudomonas, you'd want an autoinducer disruptor, right? Something that prevents the autoinducer from binding. In the case of cholera, the drug itself would be the molecule. And so there is definitely an interest in my old advisor, Bonnie Bassler, is, is heavy duty into identifying um, ways to augment quorum sensing systems in a variety of bacteria as a way of developing new antimicrobial agents. Absolutely. I have a question. Yeah. So I'm a dentist. So we have one of the most amazing uh, flora in the mouth. So more than 500 species, bacteria species. Yeah. So, I know that a lot of people are focusing in quorum sensing in oral bacteria. So how exactly more than 100 bacteria can regulate all of that in natural environment? And the same way, just, for, just changing maybe the proportions of some of the bacteria could produce that, I mean, a disease. My point is like, how could you control, or how did, bacterias can control so well ah. the quorum sensing. I mean, I guess one of the big questions when you look at the quorum sensing pathway is, you know, why in the world would you ever engineer a system where you rely on others' signals to modulate your response? And, you know, we, we can come up with <laughs> mechanisms. We don't understand that because potentially, and we think that in the quorum sensing world out there in real systems, it's not happy communication among buddies. It's they're fighting each other. Their E. coli uh, eats autoinducers. It actually takes them in and, and degrades them. So there's, there's eavesdropping and there's communication and there's battling going on. And how, I think it's probably an arms race all the time. There are, there are other bacteria like bacillus in, in soils that produce lactinases that break down the autoinducers that enzymatically degrade them. So how they synthesize all that information I mean, I don't understand that. It's incredibly complex. And of course, the environment's changing all the yeah. time. I mean, in the teeth, you brush, you brush that biofilm off and it starts from scratch again. It's fascinating to me. Great. Thank you very much.